As Turkey celebrates 100 years since the founding of the Republic, it finds itself in a turbulent region. With conflicts raging to the north and the south, just what is Turkey's place in the world right now? Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Roundtable, marking 100 years since the foundation of the Republic of Turkey. I'm Enda Brady. The country, as we know, is a strong NATO member and also has very long-standing trading links with Europe and the European Union, making it a key Western ally. On top of all of that, many thousands of Turks over the decades have chosen to make a home right here in the United Kingdom. So what role does Turkey see itself playing in this region? To help me answer that and many other questions is Turkey's ambassador to the UK, Osman Koray Ertas. Ambassador Ertas has been in the role since March. He's previously been Turkey's ambassador to Romania and he's also worked at the embassy in Washington DC and the Turkish permission to the UN office in Geneva. Ambassador, welcome to Roundtable. At your table, yes, tell me, yes. what does the centenary of Turkey mean to you? It's a huge uh, source of pride, uh, for not only for myself, and I believe for the entire nation. Because if you look where we started off on this journey, imagine 1920s, the difficulties, and where we ended up now, there's a huge progress. And these past hundred years have never been easy. We have witnessed two major wars, we have witnessed Cold War, we have witnessed uh, transition from bipolarity to unipolarity and now multipolarity. And inside the country, unfortunately, we had three military coups, which had actually undermined the democratic progress of the country. We have witnessed many wars and conflicts in our vicinity. But despite all these difficulties, now Turkey, after 100 years, is a strong, respected member of the international community. So we are proud of that. The second thing that comes to my mind when you talk about our centenary is actually motivation. We are motivated and inspired by all these successes of the past century. That's why we declared the next century as the century of Turkey. So we are inspired by the successes of our grandfathers and our generation as well. Now we set ambitious targets, but they are uh, realizable, realistic and attainable. So we believe in the power and motivation of our people and we will attain these targets in our next century. We're here in London, a city where Turkish people have worked hard for decades, contributed to the life and the culture of the city. How important is the Turkish diaspora worldwide? As you say, we have a vibrant diaspora here, a strong, about a million strong diaspora, most of them living in and around London, and we are proud of their achievements. They are contributing a lot to this country of uh, an ally of us. They are also contributing to our bilateral relationship, the relationship between Turkey and the UK. Uh, you can see many successful Turks in all walks of life, uh, from academia to businesses, from politics to culture. And uh, you also see this trend in other parts of the world as well. We have about seven million strong diaspora, mostly living in Europe, but also in Asia, uh, in Australia, in the US, as well and they are a source of pride for us as well as a nation and I'm sure all of them uh, are happily waiting uh, the centenary because uh, in my talks with my fellow uh, compatriots here in London people are very much excited uh, obviously we are doing every every year uh, national day receptions but here the civil society as far as I know and these are the ones that I know they are doing at least four or five different uh, celebrations, events to mark our centenary. So I think it's uh, a very strong force also for 
the development of my own country. Tell me about the relationship between Turkey and the UK right now. You're new to this job, you've been here, what, seven months or so? Six, yes. Six, Six. how are you settling Hopefully, in? Yeah. It's fine, I, I settled in well. Uh, I studied here for short, many years ago. I did my masters in, uh, at Sussex University. Uh, the relationship is strong, it's sound relationship. Uh, we are strategic partners, strong allies within NATO. And in every dimension of the relationship, you realize it with concrete figures. If you look to trade, for example, Britain is Turkey's largest, uh, one of the largest export markets. It's fourth largest export market. It's in top five. Britain is, again, the third largest investor in my country. If you look at tourism figures, uh, the Britons are the third largest community uh, that preferred uh, Turkey as a, a tourism destination. We have the ability to discuss all critical issues and major projects from energy to defense industry with our British counterparts. So the relationship is sound and there is a will on the political leadership to further this relationship. Uh, I believe in the future of it. Tell me, a centenary of Turkey, for 20 of those years, one man has run everything and won everything politically in Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Tell me about his influence on the Republic for one-fifth of the time it's been in existence. Well, the country has changed tremendously in the last 20 years. So any foreigner who visited Turkey in 1980s or 90s, if they come back to Turkey in 2000s, they are positively surprised to see the development in infrastructure, in economy, in the vibrancy of the society. And obviously, as a leader, President Erdogan, also during his time as Prime Minister, has played a tremendous role in that regard. The institutions uh, of Turkey have been strengthened further. Uh, the people have been mobilized around uh, the government and the state to reach the objectives uh, of the country. How important has that leadership been for Turkey? There have been turbulent times, but Erdogan strikes me as someone who works extremely hard for his people, keeps going, and Turkey is respected because of his personality. You know, in uh, social sciences, uh, they tend to devise societies as being individualistic and collectivistic societies. Most of the time, Western societies are more individualistic, and Eastern societies, of course, this may be wrong, but as a country at the crossroads, we have both. So when we have strong leaders, people, uh, unite uh, behind these strong leaders and we are seeing this pattern also in some Western countries as well and in Europe as well. So when there's a good source of motivation in terms of leadership, people work tremendously and each part of the huge machine from top to the bottom level uh, is working by focusing on the target. So uh, I should confidently say given the results and where we are now is that this has worked tremendously well in the last 20 years. Ambassador, tell me about Erdogan, the international statesman. We are living in an era where leadership diplomacy matters a lot. You have been seeing it in different parts of the world in various conflicts. And President Erdogan, with his huge experience as a leader and his respect in the international community, has become somebody whose good offices and intervention has been sought in various different conflicts around the world, including uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, and unfortunately now what we have been seeing in the Middle East. How big an impact was the Black Sea Grain Initiative that Erdogan negotiated, that he was able to speak to Putin and Zelensky and make that happen? Thanks to the uh, grain deal, uh, the world was saved from a serious food crisis. Africa was saved from a real hunger crisis, and it's worked quite well for months. Now uh, it's, it's on hold, but we don't say it's over, and we continue our diplomatic efforts. President Erdogan has been in constant touch with both leaders, and we are adamant to move forward, both on the grain deal and with similar arrangements to end this bloody conflict. What potential now is there for Erdogan and Turkey to act as a mediator between, say, Israel and Hamas? 
Honestly, we are one of the few states, and President Erdogan is one of the few leaders in the world that has the ability to talk to both sides and bring peace uh, to this conflict. What we have been seeing now in Gaza uh, and in Palestine is unacceptable. I mean, it, not only for the Turkish nation, f but for millions of people all around the world, including the ones living in Britain. You have seen the demonstrations last weekend. People are so sad to see all these dramatic scenes coming out of uh, Gaza. Obviously, all loss of life is uh, condemnable. We condemn all of this, but we need to see an end of this carnage right away without seeing further violation of international humanitarian law. The only solution to this conflict is the realization of two-state solution, uh, having a free Palestine living side by side in peace with the state of Israel. Talk to me about the European Union and accession to the European Union. Turkey formally applied to join in 1987. Here we are heading towards 2024 and nothing much seems to have changed. How important would it be for Turkey to join the European Union? Yeah, actually the journey has started even before that. In 1950s, just after the European Economic Community was founded, Turkey applied for an associate membership. And we became an associate membership in 1960s. So it has been a very long, long relationship. Whenever you ask any Turkish official, we made on the record clear that EU membership is a strategic objective of Turkey. But we will not wait forever, obviously. In any case, we believe in the benefit of this relationship. For example, thanks to the customs union, which has about a three decades old history, the Turkish economy also strengthened, was also strengthened, and our producers became more competitive. If Turkey has become an economic powerhouse in the region, Customs Union certainly has helped to this product. But in general, we expect from our uh, European partners, especially from certain European capitals, to change their mentality and to focus on the issue with a more strategic perception. Because whatever happens, Turkey is a European nation and a European country. This is a historical, economic, cultural and, and human fact. We have millions of Turks living here. So without Turkey's involvement, EU cannot become first a global player and EU cannot effectively deal with the global challenges that we have been all witnessing now, including irregular migration, energy security and economic prosperity. So it's still on the table? It is definitely still on the table. And if you may follow in recent months, there is again a kind of rapprochement between uh, Brussels and Ankara. And on technical level, actually, we have been doing our own homework, because we are doing it for our own nation, bring up our standards to the EU Aki, so that in every field, from environment to agriculture, we also bring the best standards to our own nation, regardless of our membership process. Talk to me about the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. How important is international recognition? It is important. The fact now is that there are two separate peoples, two separate democracies, and at the end, two separate states on the island. This is a fact, you cannot deny it. And there is peace in the island since 1974 after the Turkish peace operation and intervention. For 60 years, for six decades, we have tried a solution based on the old UN parameters, which is bizonal, bicommunal federation. And all of these efforts have failed, miserably failed. And in 2004, when the EU took the Greek Cypriots unilaterally to the Union, the Greek Cypriots lost all their appetite to share power with the Turkish Cypriots. So there is no need to push forward on these old parameters. Uh, we gave another chance in 2017 in Kram Montana. This has also failed. There have been 15 different UN-backed attempts for peace in the island in these six decades, and all of them have been rejected by the Greek Cypriots. So now we want to see a separate 
Turkish Cypriot state, which is de facto there, and we want an international recognition to it. And as a matter of fact, President Tatar, the current president of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, has come to power with this policy, with the two-state vision. So people voted in him. And as the motherland, we are supporting his vision. Recently on Roundtable, we heard from the former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, Jack Straw. He had a lot to say about TRNC and the Greek Cypriot administration. Just a recap for you. In retrospect, what we should have done is said uh, to the Greek Cypriots, I'm very sorry, uh, you can't accede to the European Union unless uh, you agree to this or something very similar by way of a peace deal with the North. We failed to do that. Uh, and uh, frankly, I, and this was not just my view, but the view of all the other foreign ministers who'd been involved. It exercises me, um, and I, I, I think that an awful lot of people would just have, like to avoid it, but it seriously exercises me. Um, and not only because I think we, we including uh, I myself, uh, got this wrong in 2004, but also because that there's a grave injustice there uh, to the people of the uh, North. Ambassador Jack Straw was quite outspoken about this issue. Yeah. Is he right? He is. I mean, he has been the voice of reason, and he just reiterated that again. Uh, he was a statesman who has taken part in person in all these negotiations, and he was in this close circle. So he knows who said yes, who said no. Uh, when we have been negotiating an plan, it was early 2000s, remember, we also give important concessions for the sake of peace. And while the Turkish Cypriots voted predominantly in favor of the plan and in favor of a unified structure, the Greek Cypriots overwhelmingly said no to it. And for, for that, after that, uh, they are being awarded with the EU membership. So with the EU membership, and I agree with uh, Jack Straw uh, 100%, after the EU membership, the Greek Cypriots have lost all their interest in a, a partnership state. So it was a big mistake, but it has been done. So there is no need actually to push both sides again uh, to sit on the table and agree on a formula with the old parameters. It's much better to recognize Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, and then after these two states, they will cooperate between each other on various fields, because they have to cooperate. They are living on the same island. What potential do you think TRNC has in terms of tourism and development going forward? TRNC has a huge potential. Its location, first of all, is prime, just in the middle of Eastern Mediterranean. It also has a vibrant young society. Its connections with Turkey is strong because of the geographical proximity. Whatever the island needs can easily be linked from motherland Turkey. For example, when they had a food shortage crisis, we just uh, brought uh, water from Turkey to uh, the island. We have plans in terms of energy connectivity, um, not on electricity, but uh, in other senses. Also, there's a huge potential in terms of offshore resources uh, around the island. And in all these resources, obviously Turkish uh, Cypriots have an equal say, an equal right. So um, it is a vibrant and very promising state in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean, which is ready to be partner of the international community. Talk to me about Turkish foreign policy wider. I mean, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was quoted as saying that peace at home, peace in the world should be the cornerstone of foreign policy. Is that still the way? Yes, this is still the guiding principle, one of the guiding principles of our foreign policy. Yes, times have changed, many things have changed, but some principles remain the same. The founders of our republic, notably Atatürk, our founding father, they had a vision of making a prosperous state which will be at peace with its neighbors. So uh, this idea and this vision is still valid today. We want to create a belt of stability around Turkey because without stability around us, we will continue to suffer the consequences. 
Remember who paid the dearest price when there was a war between Iran and Iraq, when there was intervention uh, in Iraq itself after the Syrian civil war. We were the ones who paid the dearest price. So we want to end all these conflicts and have good relationship with our neighbors, close ones, far ones, including the ones that we had historically difficult relationship. So we are forward looking, we are not looking uh, behind. So this motto is still guiding the modern Turkish foreign policy. Away from politics, looking forward, there's been a lot to celebrate in terms of sport for Turkey. Yeah. The women's volleyball team are European champions and the men's footballers have recently qualified for Euro 2024. Yes. A lot of very happy Turkish sports fans. Yes, yes, yes. As a Mediterranean nation, we are hot-blooded and uh, all these games actually is, you know, something that motivates the whole, uh, the whole nation. Just recently Galatasaray was here, for example. I'm, not, I'm myself a Besiktas fan, but still when our teams are playing with foreign teams, we are with them. So Galatasaray had a huge success against uh, Manchester United. So in all these successes, actually, we, we found we, uh, the whole nation uh, found itself uh, in a rightful place and we cherish the successes uh, of our sportsmen and sportswomen. Tell me about your life as an ambassador. How did you become an ambassador? Were you always interested in international relations? Yeah, well, uh, a life of a diplomat has been always glamorous when you look from outside. And w when we were at the university, uh, this was our dream job because I was an international relations student in Ankara. And for, from my class, we have about now 20 diplomats some of them are ambassadors, so it was a strong cohort. But obviously when you go inside the ministry and inside the job itself, you see how demanding and how challenging it is. Uh, obviously it's uh, a great feeling to represent your own country, your own nation. So you cannot measure it with money or with any other else. But other than this, you have to work hard, focus, and you have to put the profession of diplomacy in front of everything, including your private life. And you've previously served in Washington DC. What was that experience like? It was also a rewarding experience in terms uh, of my diplomatic career. Uh, I served at the Turkish Embassy for uh, three years and I have been finding many similarities between the British system and the American system, especially in terms of politics, media and elsewhere. So all in all, as it is also an important uh, player in inter international politics, it was uh, professionally a rewarding experience for me. And Ambassador, just looking forward, we're now entering the second century of Turkey. What would you like your country to achieve? We have many targets, like being, for example, one of the top ten economies. So I don't want to count one by one all of that. But our vision of Turkey and my personal wish of my country will be a country that is at peace with all its neighbors and environment, a vibrant nation, an economic powerhouse, and a country which is a beacon of hope and stability for millions of people in this volatile region. How will you spend the day itself, the centenary now? Um, we are having a big reception at Giltol, uh, this is uh, thanks to the strong support of the Turkish business community here, so I'm grateful to all of them. And then uh, we will be having uh, a classical music concert, which will be spearheaded by our culture center, Yunus Emre Culture Center. And then there will be a couple of uh, individual initiatives of the civil society where I will happily join. Ambassador, one final question as we celebrate a centenary of Turkey. What's your message to Turkish people all over the world who will be celebrating with their families, some of them perhaps many, many miles away from Turkey? Well, regardless of uh, our political views, backgrounds, anyone belonging to the larger Turkish family is actually belonging to this country, to this beautiful country. So your successes will be the successes of Turkey and our failures 
as people living in diaspora, will also be regarded as such by others. So everyone, especially the young people, the youngsters, should be motivated and should work hard to prepare the whole uh, Turkic world to a better century. This will be my message. Ambassador Ertesh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>